just for a second, close your eyes and think about nature or the concept of nature very intensely. What's the first image that comes to your mind? Um, who is picturing trees or forests, for instance? Can you raise your hands? Oh, that's, that's quite a few. I think it's probably more than half of you, right? How about lakes or uh, incontaminated uh, alpine landscapes? Anyone? Uh, mountains are popular too, but not that much, right? So how about algae blooming, for instance, like this one pictured by satellite in the Baltic Sea? Any algae blooming guy? <laughs> okay, okay, so mycelium networks? Where are the microbiologists here? There must be at least one. Okay, let's see if this will change by the end of the presentation, right? So you may wonder why I'm talking about this, uh, these things, and since I'm supposed to talk about cities, but I think today, to really investigate the, the, the idea of future cities, we need to start from nature, or better, from uh, the modern concept of nature that we all share. And that is because modernity has brought us a very fundamental idea and that is that uh, bacteria or microorganisms are dangerous and needs to be removed from our urban environment. So uh, at the root of modernity is the notion of sanitation, right? And, uh, you know, to be fair, this started even before. Think about uh, Haussmann's renovation of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Paris. So the, the Champs-Élysées, this big boulevard cutting through the dirty medieval town. Or, for instance, the first public park in the East London, uh, Victoria park open to the public to, to give them some fresh air to, to, to breathe, right? So uh, these examples really uh, uh, tell us uh, that, that, that sanitation is, is, is really into our, uh, the shaping our cities, but I think the modern movement really took this to the next level and turned it into a style. So the, this kind of clean, nice, modern-looking surfaces of, of modern architecture came to symbolize the uh, human's rational ability to frame nature, and especially the, the most threatening aspects of it. And, and at the scale of the city, uh, this rational uh, attitude was brought into uh, removing or moving uh, functions of productions like energy productions or uh, uh, the, the treatment of waste outside of the city centers, technically separating them from our living quarters or leisure areas, so, uh, so to prevent contamination, of course. But at the same time, the effects was to remove them from our site. And so I think at the more fundamental the mental level also from our consciousness. So this is the origin of the modern city, what I call the metabolically linear city. That means resources come in on one side, waste goes out on the other side. We don't know, don't care too much about where they're coming from and when they are going. It's basically up to the biosphere to, to uh, you know, do the rest of the work. And, and I think we're all more or less now aware that as we are approaching uh, 4 billion, actually we are beyond 4 billion uh, people living in dense urban environments uh, uh, globally, the strain that this is putting on the biosphere is enormous and, and some of its uh, ecosystems are being pushed uh, uh, outside of uh, equilibrium, let's say, in in the, in the kind of tipping point, but yet we fail to act. Uh, this is the news, everyday news. You see, uh, you know, U.S. pulling out of the Paris Treaty. The mayor of London, from, you know, supposedly a progressive mayor, still uh, struggling to implement far-reaching policies. And why is that? I, I often ask myself, why is that? And and of course there are multiple reasons, political, economical, etc. But I think one very important and often overlooked reason is really nature or our modern concept of nature. And I think that, uh, you know, we came to believe that uh, the, the, the rationally organized habitat that we uh, consider our, our uh, living uh, environment uh, uh, really applies a stand to, to the whole biosphere. In, in other words, we have developed a, a machine-like model of nature, I believe, which is uh, you know, kind of grounded in the ideas of, uh, of growth, of prosperity, of equilibrium, right? And so we think about regreening cities or renaturalizing forests as if such easy fixes can be at all possible. Like, you know, at some point we, we would be able to anyway plant a few trees and sort of rebalance the biosphere before it completely falls apart, right? But the problem is uh, the biosphere doesn't work like that. Nature is a, is a non-linear complex dynamic system 
That means that there are millions or trillions of little feedback loops interacting one with the other. And of course, there is growth, uh, there is life on one side, but there is also dissolution, destruction, digestion, and death on the other side. And, and these components are fundamental to the circularity of uh, natural ecosystems, right? So, of course, they, these processes tend to happen in the dark. Uh, you know, they smell, they generate in us this kind of atavistic fear of contagion. And, you know, in that sense, we, we much prefer removing them from, from our consciousness. They, they have become uh, this uh, kind of dark side of ecology, uh, as some people uh, call them, right? But uh, at the same time, uh, scientists are discovering every day the exceptional properties of such microorganisms and things that happen at these micro scales uh, really is what makes possible to turn what we understand as waste or pollution and, and, and sort of back into useful raw material nutrients for the next, next cycle of growth to happen. So I believe uh, this kind of hidden world is uh, the key, uh, the, the missing link to our future uh, uh, metabolically circular city. So we took this vision together with my team in Tallinn, uh, which is the capital of Estonia, for a project called Anthropocene Island. Um, the project site is a very peculiar peninsula at the, at the outskirts of the city. It used to be a Soviet military base, which was abandoned after Estonia's independence. And as often happens in this case, it was sort of recolonized by nature, and birds, especially migrating birds, found it a, a sweet spot uh, for, for nesting and resting. And uh, more recently, it was also the site of the main wastewater treatment uh, plant of Tallinn, right in the middle of the peninsula. Ever since that happened, a kind of struggle or battle uh, came up between the management of the plant and local ecologists or bird watchers claiming the plant is contaminating uh, their natural reserves. I think this is a kind of classic case of uh, you know, kind of green versus uh, dark uh, ecology, right? But what is uh, particularly interesting, and we just uh, almost by accident found out when visiting the site, is that birds don't seem to look at it in that way. You see in this piece of footage uh, that birds are quite happy to, to hang around in the kind of warm and nutritious waters of the wastewater treatment plant and even seems to play with the kind of uh, heavy machineries uh, there, right? So um, in that sense, we decided to take, uh, let's say, the, the, the bird perspective and, 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 uh, and take it uh, as, a, as a starting point for a speculative project about the future of Tallinn. And uh, this uh, non-anthropocentric approach, as I should call it, became the topic of uh, this year's Tallinn Architecture Biennale. You see the main exhibition here in the back. And um, we, we really really wanted to make it into a kind of lab, uh, uh, a kind of collective project on uh, the future city. And, and we invited 11 uh, groups between uh, scientists, artists, architects working together on this uh, proposal. And the idea, the basic idea of this proposal was to, to imagine a new city model that would grow from the waste of contemporary Tallinn. Right? So almost like the other way around as it normally happens and integrate microorganisms in the built environment, within the built environment, so that biodigestion could become the founding principle of the new city. Um, the, the proposal started by uh, uh, imagining or reimagining the peninsula as a kind of distributed habitat where uh, little uh, biodigesting gardens, as we may call them, would receive the wastewater from Tallinn and begin to process it. Uh, the process would obviously generate a, a surplus of heat and nutrients which would begin to create peculiar niches, peculiar micro climates, right? And, and that, in turn, in the kind of feedback, big feedback loop model uh, uh, that, that is typical of biosphere, will begin to generate uh, the possibility for an expanded ecosystem, new species settling in, increasing the photosynthesis, increasing the level of biomass that can be produced. And eventually, of course, from that, new resources uh, uh, could be fed back to the city of Tallinn itself. So what we would create is a new city that is, in a way, symbiotic of the existing city, right? 
But another interesting aspect of this project was uh, the, the, the kind of vision, obviously, is populated by different uh, uh, systems of the human beings that are uh, perhaps at the core of it, but at the same level of importance, I think we have microorganisms, we have machines, uh, we have birds, we have a, a kind of communication systems. And so we started to think about this new collective group as, as a sort of form of biocitizenship, right? So we understand this collective as uh, a kind of a, a, a new group that would found the, this uh, kind of metabolically circular uh, biotallin. And this idea of biocitizenship, let's say, of this kind of extended understanding of who is participating in the shaping of our cities is a kind of key notion of, our, of one of our longest uh, uh, projects, which is called Urban Algae Farm. The basic idea of the project is to create or to design habitats for microalgae, microorganisms like microalgae, to grow as part of the building envelope. Right? This project was uh, uh, running for more than is running for more than 10 years, and and the, the interesting one of the key aspects of it is that. Uh, uh, within this framework, microalgae are not just simply photosynthesizing the energy from the sun like they normally do, uh, but they are also fed by the outputs of our built environment, especially CO2, which is one of the fundamental building blocks. So in that sense, they become a kind of active layer that exists across the metabolism of both natural environment and urban environment. So, in other words, they, uh, they become, uh, in my mind, a kind of connecting layer uh, between, between the city and the biosphere. And, of course, there are multiple interactions that can be activated by the intelligence of these colonies. And this is an example of a public space we created in Milano, uh, where, where all of a sudden new uh, interferences and new collaborations between uh, this uh, micro world and uh, the world of architecture can, uh, can emerge. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, microorganisms actually grow faster within uh, our artificial habitats. And this is because they are nurtured by the emissions of our building. The heat, the excess heat, the CO2 we constantly produce, it's actually for them nutrients. It, it pushes, it promotes their growth. And in turn, the biomass uh, that they generate becomes source of energy, source of nutrients for, for us and, and for our city. So it's, again, it's a new kind of symbiotic relationship that we can begin to imagine and that, uh, you know, it's, it's a completely uh, turning upside down the paradigm of modernity. So we start seeing building as something that is not necessarily finished when we end the construction and we leave the building site, but the building itself becomes a, a, a system that evolves uh, continuously. And our job as designers is to imagine uh, uh, really new urban typologies uh, that can accommodate this, uh, this uh, new expanded notion of citizenship. And uh, this year has been very exciting for us because that's when we completed our biotech hut project in Astana. It's our first permanent uh, biotechnological building. And uh, it's, of course, um, uh, the dimension, the size of it is more or less 180 square meters in plan. It can host a large families with friends and so on. And especially it, it has a system to, to host 1,600 liters of cyanobacteria, of living cultures of cyanobacteria. And the culture grows within uh, uh, these glass tubes that you see there, like integrated within the skin of the building. And in optimal condition, the building produces approximately one kilogram of dry algae uh, per day. And this may not sound much to you, but actually it's equivalent to one liter of biofuel, which releases approximately 10 kilowatt hour of energy. That's what the UK average home needs to power its system. So in other words, we have created a system, a model of self-sufficiency, of circularity uh, in terms of energy. But that's, of course, wasn't enough for us. Uh, you know, one of the crucial uh, topic I mentioned to you is really to create a deeper relationship is not just absorbing our waste but it's feeding us back right and we are going to become 5 billion urban dwellers in in 10 15 years how do we feed an healthy diet to 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 all of this uh, uh, population and uh, chlorella for instance is one of the most popular microalgae uh, around it contains 60 percent of vegetable proteins that means the biotech hut could actually produce 600 grams of protein that feeds 12 adults 
And if we compare it to our meat-based protein diet, it requires eight cows to do that. So it is a substantial amount, if you think about that. We can completely substitute uh, uh, this, this stream uh, if we wanted to. And of course, uh, eight cows emit uh, uh, greenhouse gases, methane. The farming industry is the bigger emitter of greenhouse gases, more than any city combined together. That's not many people know about it, right? So we not only reduce that, but as I said before, microalgae absorb CO2 to, to grow. So uh, the biotech uh, absorbs two kilograms per day, which is equivalent of 32 trees. So again, if we compare it with, with uh, something we know, it's like having a kind of family-run microforest integrated within our building skin. So I, I, I told you all these numbers just to give you a kind of spatial and material understanding of really the potential, the efficiency of uh, integrating microcultures in the, in the built environment, in the urban fabric. And this is obviously a crucial transition because, as I said before, that means turning the urban fabric into its, its ability to synthesize resources. So it goes from being just a container of functions, right, how it was in, in the sort of modern paradigm of the machine for living, and it becomes itself a dynamic process of production a living machine. And in the world, in the realm of living machines, things are very different. We all know it. Living machines can uh, synthesize information, matter, energy, in a way that is completely different from the way we actually generate and distribute energy today. So this is the key from moving from this linear metabolism I showed you before to uh, a kind of multiple interlocking circular uh, metabolisms. And uh, this also has a very strong impact on the shape of our cities, right? It's about uh, kind of moving from centralized grids, which are uh, the one we, we are used to today, going from main power station, dams, wind farms, to all of our houses. So this image of the tree, again, the centralized grid, to distributed networks. Uh, distributed networks mean each one of our houses, parks, public space, arenas, is going to become both a producer and a consumer of energy. And there will be continuous exchanges between one another. And with my team, we try to, to visualize this model, to study this model, what kind of intelligence we will need to make this, uh, to make this happen. And, and we, in the last four years, we started to work with this really unique creature, which is called slime mold. You see it in action here in the video. It's a protist, a single cell organism, which contain within its membrane thousands or millions of nuclei. In the plasmodium, phase, which is the one you see here, the nuclei are afloat and interact one with the other uh, through biochemical reactions. And what is fascinating is that they leave traces in the environment, uh, which uh, in time accumulate to, uh, to, to create a distributed spatial memory of the interaction. This is the key for the kind of intelligence that this, uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, organism is able to develop, which is called emerging collective intelligence. And, and in that sense, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's beautiful that it's really through this multiple interaction that, that something emerges. And uh, you know, we developed apparatus to try to record and understand these aspects, uh, like the one that you see here, uh, uh, developed together with bio artist uh, Heather Barnett. And, and of course, when you see them from, from, uh, from, from far, it, there is similarities to, to some of our urban networks, which is fascinating. But in this case, there is no designer, there is no engineer, there is no architect, there is no central intelligence. It's really the product of emergent collective intelligence at work. So to conclude this journey in urban microbiology, I want to try to uh, repeat the uh, little experiment we did at the beginning and see if we get some different results. So if you close your eyes again, just for a second and think yourself as an ecologist, as an activist uh, fighting, uh, uh, let's say, to save our planet from the catastrophe of uh, climate change. And who would you rather be? Uh, a tree hugger like these ones or a zombie? Thank you very much.